What about this man here, if, if this is indeed Christopher Marlowe? <clears throat> well, he does at least have the track record of being an excellent writer in the same genre as William Shakespeare and is acknowledged as um, a very um, powerful influence on, on Shakespeare's writing. He essentially uh, not, didn't exactly completely invent blank verse drama, but he's the first person to make it work, and the English history play. He wrote long narratives um, out of Ovid, you know, so he has Hero and Leander. Um, the first publication with William Shakespeare's name on it is, is Venus and Adonis, which is um, almost you know, the sort of pair of poems, very similar poems. He's, so a, he's, he's a great writer. He has the right to writing course, Of course, we would say, background. but he ain't Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. Well, he certainly wasn't Shakespeare at the time he's supposed to have died at the age of 29, but then nor was Shakespeare. And I think you said in your book, Stanley, um, Shakespeare and Co., you said that if Shakespeare had died in the same year that Marlowe's meant to have died, 1593, we would regard Marlowe as the better writer. No, what I said was if Shakespeare had died in the same year as Marlowe did die, Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, I slightly, uh, yes, you're quite right. Changed, uh, uh, we would regard I, I, Marlowe as a better writer. Yes, I believe that. Uh, mm. There would have been more great writing from Marlowe than there had been at that point from William Shakespeare. Yeah. Because... Though, of course, at that time Shakespeare had already written some plays, so if you think Marlowe wrote them as well, you well, have a there, bit there, of there, a were, there were plays that were already written which we now attribute to Shakespeare, but they, nothing appeared with the name William Shakespeare on it until um, a couple of weeks after Marlowe died or so. Oh, 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 well, there are the plays in the first folio, are they attributed that we, to Shakespeare? Yes, there? but they're not attributed to him until 1623, and in fact, until the 1920s, quite a lot of Orthodox scholars, including some very you know, well-respected names, attributed things like the, um, the Henry VI plays to Marlowe. Um, so, in fact, you know, the, there, there was a whole school of thought that some of those early plays were essentially Marlowe plays that Shakespeare had taken on and rewritten and adapted. And, um, I mean, Ros, the your novel, um, takes the premise that Marlowe didn't die in yes. 1593 and um, I, I'm not sure I'm not sure whether that's something you you actually believe or not you don't you question the evidence I question died. the evidence around his death yeah but that the, the evidence doesn't have to be true in order for your novel to tell a good story no no it is a work of fiction yeah. as I keep trying to reassure people and and you, you can thoroughly enjoy it no matter who you believe is the author of Shakespeare especially if you love Shakespeare because I've caught a lot of sort of Shakespeare mm. references you, in you see for, 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 for Stanley and I it does matter um, absolutely that the evidence that is exists for Marlowe's death a coroner's report and a burial record are good enough pieces of historical evidence wherever one's coming from mm. which make them undeniable well i mean th this was the interesting point for me when i read um, charles nichols chapter mm. in your book uh, on marlowe is that charles nichols himself has written uh, a a very excellent book i have to say the reckoning and and uh, then another version of it 10 years later in which he very much disputes that the inquest document is true now he doesn't dispute the burial record but he does dispute the inquest document he raises all kinds of issues with it as people have ever since it was first discussed in 1925 and the fact is that there's been no real agreement as to the veracity of the inquest document you know scholars have been very much split and I would say the majority believe the inquest document to be false well so, the important thing is that it is that he's dead and you're not disputing that evidence if he's dead he can't go on to write the works of Shakespeare well, okay. of course this is all partly to do with the fictional you've written this excellent fascinating novel in verse with a number a great many different poems in it is not a single verse narrative and it's only one of many, many uh, novels that have been written. The most famous one, perhaps, is the one by Anthony Burgess, yes, Nothing Like the Sun. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have a chapter in our book by Paul mm -hmm. Franson about fictional treatments of this topic. There have been many, many novels over, over a good, as you said yourself, the first suggestion of Marlowe came in a novel about mm -hmm. 100, a little less than 100 years ago. It's interesting, and Paul Franson in his chapter identifies fictional tropes among that body of work, that genre. And one of them is that Shakespeare has to be presented normally. He normally is presented in that in that um, in that genre as a as an uneducated uh, person from uh, you know a, a town which is in a sort of backwater. Mm. And that constant trope we had it in the film Anonymous. Oh, very yeah. much so. Where he's a drunken, illiterate buffoon. Mm. And, and actually, one of the things about the Marlowe papers is Shakespeare hardly appears. Yes. So, <laughs> I, I just wondered why that was the case. <laughs> Yes, I did um, completely sideline him, I agree. Um, I had him agreeing to be the front and sort of represent the plays, but he, he 
Well, actually, one of the things I base that on is is the fact that there is so little um, personal testimony around him that he doesn't seem to have hung out with other writers. We don't have anything, um, you know, he doesn't seem to belong to that circle of writers in London. And, you know, no one ever reports a conversation with him in a pub or, you know, there's no obvious communication with him. He doesn't get involved in that commendatory poems business. And so he seems to me a very taciturn man. He keeps himself to himself. And, um, and also, because I know Diana Price has shown that there are, place, there are periods of time when we expect him to be in London, and then it turns out that he's in Stratford, he's doing some business in Stratford. So I imagined him being really quite absent for the purpose of the book. I thought that would work rather, rather well. But I think, you know, I, I agree that there is this trope in fiction of, of really diminishing as much as possible um, William Shakespeare of Stratford and um, sometimes making him quite an objectionable character. And I think that is, you know, entirely um, for the purpose, I suppose, of making a good story or something, you know, making a baddie. Um, I didn't want to make him a baddie. I think if he was, you know, in the role, which he is in the novel, where he's protecting this man's life by uh, agreeing to front his plays, then, you know, he's, he's doing him good service, you know, he's doing a good job. So I didn't want to take him apart. My favourite depiction of Shakespeare in any novel is in Virginia Woolf's Orlando, in which um, Orlando sees Shakespeare writing and it's a rare account in any work of how Shakespeare physically sat or looked when he was writing and the whole narrative just stops and you know it's supposed to be Shakespeare and he keeps cropping up in Orlando and Orlando stares at Shakespeare from across the room and is this a writer <laughs> tell me everything that ever happened in the world it's a marvellous moment but think about part two Shakespeare as author theorizing Shakespeare's authorship by Andrew Hadfield, the University of Sussex. Um, that, that chapter really is, is incredibly helpful, I think, because it's, it's about helping us all to relax about the fact that we shouldn't be worried about there being gaps in the records of people's lives, or that the kinds of records that we would most wish to see in someone's life don't in fact survive and aren't there. I did have a problem with that chapter. I mean, Andrew is, uh, you know, a someone I know rather well as my PhD supervisor. But, um, you know, he'd already been challenged on this point, um, I believe, when he put this in 60 minutes and challenged with the data of Diana Price, because it is actually unusual. The number of gaps, the amount of gap that there is, if you like, this man-shaped um, absence of data um, is, is actually extraordinary. And, you know, I thought it was problematic for me in that chapter that he, I would like to see an answer to Price. I haven't yet seen an answer to Price's data showing that Shakespeare's, um, the gap in Shakespeare evidence um, that actually shows he was a writer, because we have a huge amount of evidence about him, um, more than any other writer, but not related to writing. It's how you so, approach evidence, isn't it? It's how you, yeah. what you decide to do with that evidence. And Diana Price is, has, has, a, has a different agenda, I think, there with her telling of history. Andrew Hadfield... Um, is right in saying that we shouldn't be worried about well gaps is he in the record. is he is he because those they are extraordinary gaps they're not the usual gaps they are exceptional gaps and that hasn't yet been answered and I'd love to see an answer to that but well, in, sorry sorry Kaka Harrison well I can say in my chapter the next chapter of the book I, I produce a great many allusions to Shakespeare as a writer uh, but they don't link to the Shakespeare Shakespeare of Stratford and there's no link to him until long after he's dead, but that's 1623. That's that 1623, have, you know. but that's only seven years after he's dead and why, and why not? Why, why, well, why, why discount evidence from after somebody's dead? Can, can, I, yeah. so can I just jump in here and say we, the first reference to that by corroborative evidence in the first folio, 1623, mm. that funeral bust might have gone up in 1616. We do not know the date. No, years. we don't know when it went up. It's true. We don't know when it went up. But the point is, I, I, I want to know. I don't know if we can ever know, but I do want to know why there aren't references to him that show him that he actually knew other writers and that he had any kind of writerly life. Well, there are writers who talk about a writer called William Shakespeare. Shakespeare. Yeah. And, and that's I not I disputed. Mean, and and suddenly very, very, um, I mean, I, I like, you know, you really take us through it year by year. And I really appreciate that, you know, piece by piece by piece through the evidence of writers who know that there is a writer who publishes under that name William Shakespeare but none of them know him personally there's no there's certainly no um, indication that they know him personally if they did know him personally then it reveal well, a personal it's not quite true I mean there's the Manningham anecdote about Shakespeare but that's an anecdote well, and he's heard it from Mr. Carl can, can so he, does, he clearly doesn't know Shakespeare personally and also we don't know it doesn't say that he's a writer we can't I think he's we connected can't, to theatre but I think what I'm hearing from you Ros which is 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 an absolutely completely understandable longing 
we, we sometimes don't have the evidence for the kind of things that we would like to have evidence for. And the okay. fact that we don't have evidence isn't evidence of absence. But if you ask someone who's in evidence science, like Professor David Shum, who is you know, Emeritus Pref Professor of Evidence Science at UCL, he says that if, where there is absence of evidence where you would expect evidence to be, that in itself is an important piece of evidence that needs to be accounted for by any experimentary well, analysis. We can't, we can't so, always account for evidence.